Yeah, so th this is going to be a very uh, informal uh, talk, although some of the, the more formal aspects will be on the, uh, the handout. But I'm, I'm concerned with just to give some general ideas about uh, applications of uh, modal logic within uh, philosophy. And, uh, and, and towards the end, I'll say something about uh, possible uh, future directions uh, for research. The, the, the guiding spirit behind uh, my remarks will be um, what one can call anti-exceptionalism um, about, about logic. Um, in other words, I mean, except, exceptionalism would be the view, about logic would be the view that logic is somehow radically different from any other kind of uh, discipline in its uh, methodology and uh, epistemology, maybe and its metaphysics too. Um, and that's what I'm opposed to. It seems to me fundamentally logic is, is not as different from other subjects as uh, we might like to, uh, to think. And that will be the... Um, the approach that's in informing uh, what I say uh, here, uh, and in particular as applied to, to modal logic. Now, of course, it, it, technical uh, modal logic is, um, is mainly concerned with the, uh, the meta theory um, of, of modal uh, logic, the in, uh, investigations, well, mainly of the model theory of modal logic, but also of the to some extent of the, uh, the proof theory of modal logic. Um, and uh, and those, those, of course, are, they're done uh, in a, uh, a meta-theory that is basically just the language of, uh, well, in, in a language which is basically just that of, of mathematics. And, and the meta-theory in that sense of modal logic uh, is uh, fundamentally simply a branch of mathematics and uh, the, the same standards of uh, methodology and epistemology apply to it uh, as to any other branch of mathematics. Um, but that's, that's particularly striking for modal logic uh, because, um, I mean, modal logic is, is usually thought of as the logic of uh, modalities of uh, which we can, although there are different ways of thinking about it, we can say, you know, the logic, roughly speaking, of uh, possibility and uh, necessity. Um, but those, uh, the ideas of possibility and necessity, as it were, the ones that we might symbolize with the, the bo diamond and the, the box, I mean, those, those are not part of um, the, the mathematical language in which we pursue the meta-theory of uh, modal logic. I mean, you, these are not symbols of standard mathematics or, well, actually, this one is sometimes used, but to, it's used to mean something completely different in mathematics, you know, it's a symbol at the end of a proof. But, um, so, so we've got the striking thing that the, the meta-theory of, of modal logic uh, is done in a completely non-modal meta-language. Um, and, and so, as far as that goes, there's nothing particularly modal about those uh, investigations. But, of course, we also want to do something which is not just the meta-theory of uh, modal logic. We want to uh, apply modal logic uh, to, to something that's a specifically modal subject matter. And, and when we do that, we're not just doing the abstract mathematical meta-theory, we're interpreting whatever modal language we're using, I mean, propositional or first order or higher order, uh, um, in, in some way uh, or other. And um, that we're then concerned not with the meta-theory, but actually with the theories themselves as formulated uh, within this, this interpreted uh, modal uh, language. Um, and 
that's when we, the methodology will have, often have to go beyond uh, the mathematical methodology of the, uh, the meta-theory. Uh, now, of course, one question is how we're actually going to um, specify the, the kind of interpretation of the, uh, the modal uh, object language that we're interested in. And, I mean, a simple way of doing that is by uh, specifying a, an intended model of the, uh, the language. So, um, you know, w when we're doing the meta theory, we're generalizing over all models of some specified kind, maybe all Kripke models or something like that. Uh, and um, and the, ge the general notion of a model is just a mathematical notion. But, but one way to interpret a modal language is by actually picking out one particular model and saying that's the, the model uh, that, that we intend because we're actually going to use this language with a specific uh, interpretation. Um, if, we're, if we're concerned uh, with uh, applications of, uh, of modal logic to, uh, to metaphysics in particular, um, there is a problem with uh, that way of uh, uh, interpreting the modal language. Um, which, which has to do particularly with um, first order or higher order quantified uh, modal uh, logic uh, concerning the, the, the range of the, or the domain of the quantifiers. Uh, because uh, if we're talking about standard model theory uh, for, the, uh, for modal logic or actually any kind of uh, logic, the, the domain of the quantifiers is, I mean, is specified uh, in set theoretic terms. It's a, it's a set of uh, objects. Um, and th that clashes with one of the uh, ambitions of a lot of uh, metaphysics, because metaphysics often is, is uh, concerned with making statements of unrestricted uh, generality, where we, we want to make a, a universal generalization about a absolutely everything. Um, and you know, although, the, the, of course, there's a worry about whether that's going to produce some kind of paradox, like Russell's paradox, uh, um, I think it can, in fact, coherently uh, be done. But, of course, it, that means that the intended interpretation for a metaphysical uh, theorizing um, involves uh, a domain which is not a, a set because the, um, there's no universal set according to standard uh, set theory. So that's already one reason why we, we can't do anything quite as uh, simple as just specifying an intended uh, model for the uh, met metaphysical interpretation of uh, modal logic because uh, no model uh, it, has a domain as well that's big enough to be the, 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 uh, the intended model for uh, metaphysics. Um, the, the, there are other reasons as well why we, w that might not be the, the best approach, just specifying an intended uh, model. But a different thing that we can do to uh, interpret the object language of quantified modal logic for purposes of application to, uh, to metaphysics is, is simply informally to explain how we're going to understand the, the quantifiers um, and the modal operators. And I think in, um, in metaphysics, the, the most salient and uh, central uh, interpretation is, is one where we interpret the quantifiers by saying that they're completely unrestricted. They're quantifying over anything uh, whatsoever. Um, and, and we interpret the, the modal operators in terms of uh, metaphysical uh, modality, so that we, uh, we understand the diamond as meaning metaphysical possibility and the box as meaning metaphysical necessity. Now, of course, there's a, a question uh, about just what is intended by 
m metaphysical possibility and uh, necessity. I mean, the, I guess the, the kind of paradigm that people uh, have in mind uh, when, they, when they think of uh, metaphysical modality is uh, Kripke's uh, distinction in naming and necessity between um, necessity and uh, the, which is a metaphysical idea as he understands it, versus uh, the epistemological idea of the a priori. Um, I want to understand that distinction in a fairly abstract uh, sense, um, which actually does correspond to things that Kripke says in, in Naming a Necessity, where he talks about uh, necessity in the highest degree, uh, where he's distinguishing between um, metaphysical necessity and maybe something more restricted like physical uh, necessity. And, that, um, and then if we're thinking of, of it that way, then metaphysical necessity would be the, um, the strongest kind of necessity. And when I'm talking about kinds of necessity here, I mean uh, objective sorts of necessity as contrasted with some kind of epistemic uh, understanding of necessity, which would be something more like the, uh, the a priori. But I'm, I'm thinking of ones which in some sense have to do uh, with the reality in, in general or some part of reality, but not specifically about which, concerning our knowledge of uh, reality. Um, so, so then the, the idea is that, as it were, if something is, is metaphysically necessary, then that may, in, entails that it's going to be objectively necessary in, you know, in, in, any, in the sense of any more restricted objective modality. And if, it has, if something is objectively possible in any sense, it, it will thereby be uh, metaphysically uh, possible. So that's a kind of a, a rough sketch of the understanding of the, the metaphysical necessity and possibility that I have in mind. Um, and then once we've got that interpretation of the, the language of uh, quantified modal logic, then we can understand various uh, principles that we can formulate within that language, it, just using it as, an, uh, um, as it were, as a language of uh, science, um, which correspond to, uh, to different uh, metaphysical uh, theories. Um, and, and so the, the ex example that I have on the, on the handout on the, uh, the first page is, is this uh, formula uh, which I've called um, NNE, which uh, you, I mean, that's meant to be short for the, the necessary necessity of uh, existence. So it's, uh, this, this is simply a formula of um, quantified modal logic with identity, which um, says that necessarily everything is necessarily something. And uh, the, uh, I take the, the view that uh, accepts that, uh, that formula, uh, that's uh, what I mean by uh, necessitism. And uh, the, the, then the, the, the contradictory uh, view would be one which accepts its negation, that, which is equivalent to saying that possibly something uh, is possibly uh, nothing. So uh, roughly speaking, um, what NNE says is that uh, ontology is uh, necessary, um, specifically in the sense that, that there's, the, there is no contingency in, uh, in which things uh, there is, uh, there are. And, uh, and of course, the, the contingentism is the contrary view that, uh, that there is contingency in uh, which uh, things uh, there are. Um, and, you know, I take it that the dispute between a necessitist and a contingentist is in some ways just a, a regular, normal 
scientific dispute uh, about uh, how things are. It's, it's not something to be explained by saying that the necessitist and the contingentist uh, mean different things by the, the, the modal operators or by the, uh, the quantifiers. Because th both sides can accept the, the characterization that I gave earlier of both the, the intended meaning of the quantifiers and the intended uh, meaning of the modal operators. But, so, as it were, roughly speaking, as m maximal uh, interpretations of both of them. So, th 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 they're using a, a common language with shared meanings, but they, they're simply dis disagreeing, in effect, about what is true and what is false uh, in that uh, language. Um, and, um, of course, when we have a dispute like that, that means that these potential axioms of modal logic, I mean, of course, uh, you know, I, I put it in terms of N, NNE and not NNE, which is, which are just, each of them is just a single formula. Uh, but uh, there are also more uh, the general uh, principles um, involved, like the, um, I mean, the Barkin formula and the, uh, the converse, Barkin formula, which, uh, which are, we, we could also have as axiom uh, schemas. Uh, of course, I mean, they're called the Barkin formula and the converse Barkin formula, but actually there's some version of those uh, principles those already uh, found in, in uh, Avicenna. Um, but, but, I mean, one thing to, to notice is that although we're calling these axioms, as well, the, the necessitist axiom and the, and the contrary uh, contingentist axiom, they, they don't have the, the kind of epistemological or, in a way, semantic properties that you might associate with axioms in logic. I mean, neither of them is self-evident. Um, and n neither of them is analytic in the sense you know, of being something that you have to accept in order to count as understanding the, the language. I mean, they, um, they, I mean, both the necessitist and the contingentist, we can assume, are perfectly competent users of this uh, modal language. They are in the sense that they understand what the, uh, the formulas uh, mean because they, they share this kind of joint understanding that I was, I was explaining uh, before. It's simply that they have a, a disagreement about, roughly speaking, the nature of uh, reality, the, of uh, metaphysical modal uh, reality. Um, and, of course, the, this, uh, this distinction between necessitism and contingentism uh, it corresponds uh, to, to various uh, differences uh, in what kind of model theory uh, you will uh, accept uh, for um, the, the modal language. Uh, so that the, I mean, the necessitist um, will, uh, will want, if we're doing model theory with Kripke models, will want uh, a constant uh, domain model theory. It, uh, in other words, with once uh, models uh, in which um, the the domain associated with each world is the is the same, uh, so that the, there's no difference in how the uh, the quantifiers are are ranging from one world to another. Whereas the the contingentist uh, will want a, a variable domain semantics where different worlds can be associated in the same model uh, can be associated. Uh, with, uh, with different uh, domains of uh, quantification. Um, but I don't think that that difference in the model theory that goes with necessitism and contingentism means that there's uh, some kind of misunderstanding or difference in interpretation between them, because fundamentally the, uh, the interpretation is, is given by 
the informal understanding of uh, of what the these uh, the quantifiers and uh, the the model operators are, are to mean, and then we're adjusting the um, the model theory uh, to that. Uh, but but that's that's secondary to the initial understanding which is shared, uh, and and the model the model theory is uh, is pursuing. Uh, as well, it's, it's taking a secondary uh, role in, in arti articulating the implications of these two different uh, theories, but they're theories about the same uh, subject matter. Um, I, I don't want to here get into a big uh, discussion of which of these views is correct. Of course, I, in um, Modal Logic as Metaphysics, I def defended a, uh, a necessitist uh, view um, of course, many many people would would regard contingentism as a a more uh, commonsensical uh, view because they they will think that, for example, everyone in this room is a, a counterexample to necessitism because they'll think you know of any particular person. Well, if your um, if your parents uh, had not met, then there would have been no such thing as you, and therefore you're a contingent being, not a, a necessary uh, one. And of course, the, the necessitist uh, response to uh, such um, purported uh, counterexamples uh, is that uh, although it may be true that if your parents had never met, um, there would have been no such uh, person as you. There would have, uh, you would not have been concrete. Uh, that doesn't mean that you would have had no kind of being whatsoever. It might simply be that, that what you would have been in those circumstances is a, 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 a non-concrete, as it were, merely uh, possibly concrete uh, being. So uh, the, the, the necessitist has a response to that kind of uh, as we're supposed, uh, common sense uh, counterexample, and uh, and the the dispute between them has to be settled on I think much more theoretical uh, grounds, uh, which are, are not so easy to uh, to come by. But I think one can give uh, more general uh, arguments. But that's not what I'm concerned with uh, today. Um, I'm. <coughs> I'm more concerned just to emphasize that this is the kind of dispute, like a dispute between uh, physicists uh, or biologists, each of whom is, you know, has their own theory and their, their theories are inconsistent with, with each other, but each theory is internally uh, consistent. And, um, and they're simply uh, they were concerned with, with trying to work out what these... Uh, which of these theories is true. And, the, and so although these theories are, are formulated uh, axiomatically, the axioms are not things that, that you have to accept just in order to understand the language. They're, they're simply postulates of the theory. And we can have that in applied uh, modal logic as well. Another reason uh, for mentioning that this particular dispute between necessitism and uh, contingentism is that it brings out a, a way in which the, the model theory um, is potentially misleading um, if we think of it as too central to the, the, the business of giving uh, in our intended meaning to the, to the language of modal logic. Um, because from, from a contingentist point of view, there's something inadequate about the, uh, the Kripke uh, semantics uh, for um, from the modal language, even even if the Kripke, if, even if you can get a version of the Kripke semantics, which validates all the tr 
or what the formulas that they would regard as true and invalidates the, uh, the others. Um, because there's, some th there's something that's, as it were, contrary to the contingent contingentists' uh, intentions with, uh, with such a, a model uh, theory. Um, so that, and this is, this is a problem that's quite different from the, the first problem that I mentioned with using model theory to, uh, to uh, specify the, uh, the intended meaning of the, uh, the, the modal language. Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't have to do with cardinality uh, problems about the, you know, the, the, because we don't have a universal set. It, it has to do with something that even arises in, in finite uh, models, because um, the, the contingentist, well, in most cases, uh, contingentists think something stronger than just the negative claim, not NNE. Um, they, they also uh, go for this uh, stronger uh, claim, which I, I, I mentioned on the handout. Uh, this is sort of lower down on the first page of the handout. So it's saying uh, possibly there exists X. Uh, such that actually, this is the actually operator here, um, for all y, x is not equal to y. So what this w formula is saying is that there could have been something which is different from all the uh, actual things. Um, and uh, and m many contingentists will regard that as a, a commonsensical claim that, that, that although it goes a little bit beyond what uh, not NNE itself says, they'll think this is also obvious. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, because they'll think that, um, well, for example, you know, um, if, if Wittgenstein had had a child, I mean, Wittgenstein didn't have any children, we're assuming, and if, but if he had had a child, that child would have been different from anything uh, that there is in the actual world. And, and so would, the, uh, as it's possible that there, there, there is this child of Wittgenstein who's, who's not identical with anything that there actually uh, is. And, and so if you, if you model this with a Kripke model, you'll, you'll have the uh, as were the actual world uh, over here, and um, and then there'll be a domain of uh, objects which are all the actual uh, objects, uh, the domain of the actual world. And then, in order to to make this formula come out true, you're going to need another world, a, a counterfactual world over here. Let's call it at W. With, uh, I mean, it may have a lot of actual objects in it, but it will also have to have at least one object in the domain of this other world, W, um, which is uh, not in the domain of the actual world in order to verify this formula. This, this object would be, uh, as it were, the, the possible, but merely possible, child of uh, Wittgenstein. But if you, if you step outside, you realize that, uh, of course, in the... Uh, in the Kripke model, I mean, that's, the Kripke model is simply a, a set theoretic uh, structure of like any other. Um, and um, all the, it's an actual set theoretic structure. It's a set theoretic structure that, is, that we have in the actual world in order to actually uh, verify this, this formula. Um, and so the, the object that is in the, uh, the domain of some non-actual world in this model, but not in the domain of the actual world of the model, uh, will itself, in fact, in reality, be an actual object, because the whole, the whole uh, Kripke model is an actual object. And so, we're, in, in doing the Kripke model theory, we're, we're, we're modeling the uh, existence of, of the, pos the, the counterfactual possibility of non-actual objects by using actual objects. And you know, from a purely model theoretic point of view, that's okay, but it, doesn't, it, it shows that the model itself is not a fully intended model uh, because uh, it, it's, as it were, using a, a kind of non-modal simulation of a, 
what is fundamentally a, a modal phenomenon from a contingentist uh, point of view. Um, so, so that if you're a contingentist, you're going to think that the, although this, the, something like the Kripke model theory is a, a very uh, effective um, algebraic kind of uh, device for investigating the, uh, the consequences and the non-consequences of mo modal theories. It's not, it doesn't really capture what is going on metaphysically uh, when we interpret the language in that uh, way. Um, and that's, of course, another reason why uh, when we're stipulating the intended interpretation of the modal uh, language for this dispute between necessitism and uh, contingentism, we need to do it in this informal way, just by explaining what we mean informally by the, by the symbols, rather than by specifying a model, because uh, for the contingentist, for this other reason, even apart from the cardinality, there is no intended uh, model. Um, So, of course, often what we're, what we're doing uh, is a, a little bit more complicated in another way, um, in the sense that, um, that we're not simply considering a single uh, formula like uh, NNE or its negation, but we're considering um, schemas of various uh, kinds, such as the... Um, for example, the uh, S5 uh, schema that if, if possibly P, then, uh, then necessarily uh, possibly uh, P. And we're, and, and we're interested uh, in all instances of this in, in the language. Um, so P can be any formula, simple or complex uh, here. Um, and you know, I think one way of uh, understanding uh, how these formulas uh, play out when they're um, being understood as principles of an interpreted uh, modal language, uh, is, to, is to think of them as uh, implicit universal uh, generalizations, which can be true or false. So, but universal generalizations where we're, in effect, we're quantifying into uh, the sentence position uh, here. And, uh, and so really what we're doing is, is we're, we're considering, if you like, laws of uh, modal logic or potential laws of modal logic uh, for a particular uh, interpretation. Um, and and these, these are principles, something like this is a principle which can be uh, true or, or false. Um, and, but in order to do that, we, we have to make the, the generality uh, explicit, because otherwise, uh, you know, even if we thought there were counterexamples, they would, um, the, the P would, would be kind of unin uninterpreted, uh, and so we, could, we, you know, we wouldn't be able to, to give a, a specific uh, truth value to this formula if we didn't... Uh, we, you know, we need that kind of uh, generality to, to specify what, what truth value we're interested in. And so these, these are laws, as if, if you like, of modal reality or, or uh, alleged laws of modal uh, reality that are, that are similar in status uh, to, to physical uh, laws. And, and similarly, if, you know, if we're concerned with laws in, uh, in first order, um, modal logic. Uh, we may, in order to, to make their generality explicit, um, we, you know, we may need to uh, quantify into predicate positions. So, uh, for example, you know, if we take the... Ooh, I have a different pen. The Barkin formula, which is, of course, actually a schema, um, something like this. Um, If we want to, to formulate it as a, a single law, which can be true or false, then we need to, to generalize on the predicate f, and we get something like uh, this. And, uh, and so that w once, w once we need to, to do that, 
uh, we're, we're, of course, going into a, a higher order uh, modal language. And, and that's, that's one of the, the main motivations for studying higher order modal logic rather than just first order modal logic, that it's only in higher order modal logic that we can be explicit about uh, some of the, uh, the, the modal uh, laws or alleged laws uh, which, which we're concerned with. Um, so, you know, so it's, it's not just that we're not just going to uh, higher order modal logic in order to get kind of uh, fancy about these uh, things. It's, beca it's because there is a specific theoretical need to, uh, to make the, the principles um, given by, by schemas explicit uh, and uh, as things that can be true or false, and, and where we're, we're, not, we're not just concerned with what particular instances they, uh, we can express of them in the, the language that we happen to have, but where we're talking about, as it were, all potential uh, instances. And actually, I, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention this on the, the handout, uh, but an, another way in which uh, making... Uh, the, the, the kinds of uh, alleged laws that we're, that we're investigating uh, explicit. Well, another way in which that can drive us into a more powerful, more expressive language than we started with uh, is uh, because uh, we, we may also be interested uh, in uh, inferences with uh, infinitely many uh, premises. You see, if, if, you, if you're just interested in inferences you know, with finitely many premises, then at least in a classical setting and in many other settings too, I mean, you can, you know, in, instead of you know, looking at whether we've got, uh, sorry, you know, whether we've got uh, a valid inference from X to Y, you can, you can simply conditionalize and look at whether uh, X arrows Y is a, is a law, and then, of course, you can, you, you can universally generalize this once you've uh, got it all on the, the right hand side, and you can you know e even if you 've got uh, several premises like x one x two um, and uh, and you, th then you can uh, you know form their conjunction um, and look at as well this as a law and then and then you may want to universally uh, quantify it in order to make the law fully explicit but uh, of course, uh, if, if you have certain uh, inferences with uh, infinitely uh, many uh, premises, which of course is particularly interesting if you've got a, a non-compact uh, consequence relation so that, that something can be a consequence of infinitely many premises without being a consequence of any finite uh, subset of those uh, premises, then, then in order to uh, to do this conditionalization so that, that we can then make the, the generality explicit with, with some kind of uh, higher order universal quantifier, you may need to use infinitary uh, conjunction as well. So as well as pressures to, uh, to go higher order in order to, to make things fully explicit, there are also pressures to go to an infinitary language to make some things uh, fully explicit. So as well, those, those are some comments on the, the use of uh, the language of uh, quantified modal uh, logic as a language for doing uh, metaphysics uh, in, in a way that is broadly similar to the methodology of uh, the investigation in the, uh, in the natural uh, sciences, uh, where when we're not looking for self-evident axioms. We're simply looking for axioms that are, in fact, uh, true. And, of course, whether they are true is something that we can investigate by looking at their consequences and comparing the, uh, the consequences of different uh, rival uh, theories. Um, in the second part of the, the talk, uh, I want to say something about uh, interpretations of, uh, of modal languages 
that it, in some ways are in a similar spirit to the, the one that I've already been uh, discussing, but which concern a much more limited uh, modalities. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, I was, uh, I was mentioning that uh, the, the metaphysical possibility I'm thinking of as the kind of maximal objective type of possibility. And when, when we're studying um, something like physical possibility, that might be a, a more restricted um, uh, type of, uh, of possibility, because there might be things which are metaphysically uh, possible but physically impossible, because they would only th th these are you know things that could only happen uh, in a un in a world w with uh, laws uh, physical laws different uh, from ours. Um, oh, and so w one one thing that I've been interested in investigating is the uh, uh, extent to which um, much more restricted kinds of uh, objective modality are involved in the, the natural sciences, such as uh, physics. Um, I mean, not, not that I'm an e expert on physics at, at all, but I, but I, I think what, you know, one can al already see that something like that is, uh, is, going, uh, is going on. And, you know, I think that, that philosophers have sometimes been sceptical about whether uh, the natural sciences really involve um, any, any kind of modality, because uh, as well, the sort of many philosophers have this sort of impression, well, um, when scientific um, investigations, I mean, in the natural sciences, get really serious, then uh, they take a, uh, a mathematical form. The laws that are being postulated are just mathematical equations of some kind uh, or other. Of course, uh, interpreted equations. But um, and uh, and then they're thinking, well, if there are equations which are written in the language of mathematics, then since there is uh, the, the modality is not present in the language of mathematics, there are no modal operators in mathematics, then these laws have, uh, have no um, modal uh, content, so that as where science isn't concerned with investigating modality. That's, that's not my view, that's the view of, uh, but of quite a lot of philosophers. And, but it seems to me that what is going on in uh, science is very often uh, a modal investigation, an investigation, of course, not into metaphysical possibility and necessity, but into po more restricted kinds of possibility and necessity, which uh, apply to certain types of uh, physical uh, system. But where the, the investigation is done for purposes of convenience and familiarity, in a, a mathematical language, but nevertheless the, interpreted, I mean, the intended interpretation of this mathematical language is a modal one. So it's, it, it, it's really just the analogue of somebody who's doing mo modal metaphysics by investigating Kripke models. Well, I mean, so when you're investigating a Kripke model, or the Kripke model itself is, as it were, is, is a, just a mathematical structure which you can investigate in a non-modal way. But of course, the, it, very often, the intended interpretation of the Kripke structure is a modal one. And so there's uh, something implicitly modal in your investigation, even though you're not actually writing um, modal operators. Um, and I mean, the, the case that I've investigated a little bit to try to, uh, to bring this out um, is uh, the, the case of a particular kind of uh, phase space uh, which, which phys physicists are, are interested uh, in, uh, known as a dynamical uh, system. And, you know, I can... If you just look at the... Um, the title of the, 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 the book that I was using, you know, just to, to get, 
the, the physicists' own sort of definitions of dynamical systems. It's, it's one called, uh, by Strogatz, called uh, nonlinear dynamics and chaos with applications to physics, biology, chemistry, and engineering. So you can see what a wide uh, range of applications these dynamical uh, systems uh, have. And what I've been concerned to do is to, to look at the, the mathematical formulations that as were the scientists themselves use, and then to articulate the implicit modal uh, content which is actually, once, once you look for it, it's very easy to, to find. Um, so so I'll, I'll just do a say a little bit about how this uh, works. So um, you know, if you look at the, the formal definition of a dynamical uh, system, it's, uh, it, what it consists of it, is a, there's a set S um, on which some kind of geometrical or topological structure is defined. I mean, it's important. I mean, that's going to do a lot of the work, but we don't need to know, uh, bother about the details of the geometry or the topology. And uh, there's also a set uh, T, which is normally uh, it's either the set of all positive and negative integers or the set of all positive and negative uh, r real numbers. Um, and there's a kind of additive structure on T. Um, and then, I mean, and T, T is going to be thought of as... The, um, the set of um, directed lengths of time. So, as it were, plus one means uh, one unit of time into the future, and minus one means uh, one unit of time back into the, the past. And the, the, uh, the set S is going to be informally interpreted as the, the set of states of a, of a physical uh, system. And then what we're interested in doing is, is studying the, uh, the dynamics of this um, physical system, which is given by a, uh, a family of uh, functions, um, one for each member of T. So, so when we're talking about um, F T of S here, so S Little, this is little s. This is, this is some state of the system. And, um, and this, this means the state that the system is in, a t an interval of time t after it's been in state s. So if t uh, is plus 1, then this will be the state that the system is in one unit of time uh, after it's been in s. And if t is it's minus 1, It'll be uh, the state that, that uh, the system is in one unit of time before it was in state uh, S. And uh, then we've got a, a, a kind of uh, a couple of uh, equations, um, Roman 1 and 2. This is on page 2 of the, uh, the handout, uh, which just make sure that uh, the, these, this family of uh, functions fits together in the way that they have to do for that uh, interpretation. Uh, to make uh, sense. And, um, and notice that, that th th these uh, dynamical systems are uh, deterministic in, in both uh, directions. They're, um, so that the state of the system at one time determines all its future states and all its past uh, states. But so, so it's, these are concerned with deterministic uh, systems. Um, and, and then, of course, in, in practice, when we're looking at any particular dy dynamical system, what we're concerned with is the behavior of the system over time as it uh, evolves. And the, and the family of functions, f of t, they give us uh, a kind of... A, what you can think of as you know, a, the laws of the uh, flow of uh, time here. Um, now, I mean, there's a specific way in which uh, we can see that th there's something implicitly modal about these systems. Um, because what, what we can do um, is we, we can divide the... Um, the, 
the states uh, into equivalence classes by an equivalence relation which says that two, two states are in the same equivalence class. If, if you're in one of them, then there's uh, some positive or negative time t such that f of t of that one will be the other one. So in other words, if you're in one of them, then sooner or later, by the dynamics of the system, you'll be in the other one. And, you know, uh, so an orbit uh, is the term that's used for one of these equivalence classes. So the, an orbit represents, uh, as a, if you like, all the states that you'll be in on some history of the system. Um, and, I mean, the crucial observation is that in, uh, in most uh, dynamical uh, systems, not in all, but in most, um, there is more than one orbit. And whenever there's more than one orbit, um, that means that whatever state the system is in, there are, there are some states some states in big S, which the, the system will never be in because they're in a different orbit. Um, and, and so those states, they're not, just, they're not past or future states, the ones in, in a different orbit from the one that the system is actually in. They're not just past or future, they're, they're counterfactual states. Uh, and, and so in that sense, these, the states that we're talking about are... The, they're not simply states that the system will sooner or later be in. They're possible states of the system. So that there's something um, modal built, built into the uh, intended interpretation of any dynamical system uh, with more than one orbit. And, I mean, of course, you could, you could think... Um, well, but can't we just, uh, res you know, if we don't want to have any of this, we, if, we, if we don't want this kind of modal stuff, couldn't we just make it temporal by uh, excluding all the orbits except as were the, the one that is actual? Uh, but th actually, th that, that would not be a, at all a reasonable thing to do because the, the geometry or topology of the, uh, the dynamical system of, of, of defined over the set of states is defined over the total set of states, and you would completely wreck the, um, the, the topology or geometry if you just restricted to a single orbit. So you really, in order to do this study, you have to consider uh, the states in all the orbits, uh, and that means that you have, in effect, to, uh, to think uh, modally. Um, so... Just to bring out how, how close this actually is to modal uh, logic, um, it, it's worth thinking about the, uh, the comparison between these states, uh, the little, as well, the little states little s in, in the big S, um, in comparison with uh, what we're used to in Kripke models. So the, uh, the initial comparison would be between states of the dynamical system and, um, and possible worlds. And in some ways, that comparison works fine because the, the states of the system are like possible worlds in the sense that, that they're um, mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive. So the state is always in, ex sorry, the system is always in exactly one of these states. And that's, that, that's com completely analogous uh, to, to what you have uh, with possible worlds, that as it were, exactly one possible world uh, is actual. Um, but that comparison between worlds and states, it, it doesn't go all the way uh, because, of course, these states are instantaneous states. And so if, if, you're, uh, if the system is, is currently in one of these states, then it may, you know, in, in a second's time, it may be in a different state. And yet both of those states will be actual. They're just at different uh, times. So a, a second sort of uh, analogy that you might consider for these states of a dynamical uh, system um, are, um, would be a, a comparison between the state and... That an ordered pair, um, let's say W T, um, of a world and a time, right? Um, 
So, you know, if, if we're doing uh, the, semant the Kripke semantics for a language with both modal and temporal uh, operators, then typically we will be using ordered pairs like this to evaluate formulas at because we, we need to know both in order to know whether a given formula is true or false in, in the model. We, know, we need to know which world we're talking about and which time within that world we're talking. Um, and so you, you could think of the, the states as being uh, like, um, like world time pairs. But that, I mean, that's a bit closer, but it still is not completely accurate because uh, one thing that these dynamical systems can do um, is to uh, cycle. So, you know, it can be that, you know, th from some state uh, S, you know, one unit of time after you're in S, you're, you're back in S again. Um, and, uh, and so... This S is the same, even though the, the T here would be different, because the T would have moved on by, uh, by one unit of time. And by the way, uh, you know, if we just want to, you know, a, a connection with a different bit of uh, philosophy, that um, th this uh, equation is, is very closely uh, connected with uh, Nietzsche's uh, idea of eternal uh, recurrence, because uh, if if a system uh, is going to be in state S uh, one second after it was, or one unit of time after it was in S, then it, that's going to be, that pattern will be repeated forever because it's a deterministic system. So whenever you've got something like this, you've got Nietzschean eternal recurrence. And that, I mean, that's not a complete coincidence, in fact, because some of Nietzsche's thinking about uh, what inspired him to think about eternal recurrence was actually um, the considerations about uh, not dynamical systems in the modern sense, but about physical systems that were al already uh, being considered in a way which we would now think of as like uh, dynamical, uh, dynamical systems. And in fact, I, I mean, one of, the thi one of the things that sort of it, it is kind of related to Nietzsche's thinking about eternal recurrence is uh, that, uh, you know, a, a pretty trivial uh, theorem about dynamical systems is that if, if you have a dynamical system with, with only a finite set S of states, then it's bound to exhibit eternal uh, recurrence. And you know, as I say, Nietzsche was in fact influenced by, by considerations sort of related to, uh, to that. Anyway, that, that means that, that it's not completely accurate to, to think of these states as world time pairs either. Um, you could also think of them, of the states, as um, something like purely qualitative uh, states. Um, because, as well, there's, you know, you might think, well, there's no qualitative difference but, between the, the, but even if the time is, you know, so. As it were, you, you, you might think of them as something like equivalence classes of world time pairs under a relation of uh, exact qualitative similarity. Um, even that is in, it's probably not right because, um, because you could have a, uh, a, a system that, whose dynamics depended on the fact that it was, let's say, it was uh, alternating um, between distinct states, um, e th but which were in some way symmetrical. I mean, so that, you know, it, it, you could have a system that was, um, you know, rotating, so that uh, in, in rotating, the, the, there would be no change in the in qualitative uh, or similarity uh, between the states, but it would nevertheless be an important mathematical feature of the case, that these were distinct states, that it was rotating rather than uh, remaining constant. So, so the, the states that you get in dynamical systems, they're, they're, you can't exactly reduce them to the states that we're more familiar with in dealing with uh, modal logic or modal temporal logic, but, but they have very, very much the same uh, flavor. When you think about it, it's, it's extraordinarily easy to do that. that. I mean, that was one thing that struck me doing this, that, that, that you, you didn't, as it were, have to, to push the, 
the things in a direction that they didn't really want to go in. It was, it, it was just completely, you know, when, uh, I mean, I've given the, the, uh, the semantics on the top of page three of the handout. I, I'm assuming the pagination is the same for the Russian uh, version. Um, and it, it, it's unbelie it was unbelievably natural and easy just to write down all these semantic principles because the dynamical system so much lends itself to this kind of uh, articulation. Um, and I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it in, in detail, but I, I should just say that the, the way I've, I've understood the, the modal operators here is, is simply as generalizing over all states in in S, which automatically gives you an S5 uh, logic for the, the, the purely modal operators. And then, uh, and then the, uh, the temporal operators have just been uh, understood in the normal way. I, I mean, in order to, uh, to make the mathematics, uh, the mathematical structure on, on S explicit, you would need some more operators. And I've given an example with the, um, an operator corresponding to an uh, open set. The, the, key, the key thing that is driving this is that the variables are being uh, are sen sentential variables. So they take sentence position, and they're being interpreted by a set of states, which, of course, is, ju is just like you, uh, what you have in uh, Kripke uh, structures. And, uh, and so the... Uh, if we're interested in you know, talking about, as it were, open sets, then, then that is naturally articulated um, by an, a, a sentential operator, which tells us when the, uh, the, the value of the sentential uh, of variable, or the, the semantic value of the sentence, uh, is, corresponds to an open set. And then, in order to express some aspects of the mathematical structure, it's also important that we can quantify into sentence uh, position. So that's the, the, the last two semantic clauses um, are concerned uh, with that. And uh, then th th there are a whole lot of uh, principles that we can uh, then uh, articulate um, in talking about the... Um, the dynamical uh, system, and what really what we're doing is we're um, we're just uh, so we're making explicit the the kind of modal structure that is implicit all along in the dynamical uh, system. And um, I mean, I, I'm not going to I don't have time to talk about all the the formulas. Uh, there, I mean, the ones, the, the one, the formula that I've called diamonds of forever is, uh, is after a, a paper by Dora and, and Goodman, which is arguing for this. It's basically just the, the principle that if uh, if something is ever possible, then it's always uh, possible. Um, and then we've got a uh, 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 the th these are the. Um, uh, well, at least in the English version, these, these are the principles that near the bottom of uh, page three of the handout. Uh, we've got a, a com a, an unrestricted comprehension principle uh, for the this sentential uh, quantifier, um, because, it's, it, because the sentential quantifier is effectively ranging over all sets of uh, states. And, and then something that just comes out as a, a corollary of uh, the... the this natural setup is the propositional equivalent of necessitism. Um, that's the, the, the formula necessarily for all V, um, it's necessary that there exists V such that um, necessarily you, if and only if V. Um, because the necessity necessarily u if and only if v, that just corresponds to the identity of the set of states uh, expressed by the, the sentential variables u and v, so that we could actually just write this as necessarily for all v, necessarily there exists v such that u equals v. So you can see even, even more easily uh, that it just corresponds to uh, necessitism. 
And I mean, this, of course, this is the propositional version. It's not the, in, not the version for first order quantifiers. But um, that you get this principle uh, is just a, a, a straightforward uh, corollary of the um, of the semantics and this you know I haven't done any, I, I didn't do anything weird in the semantics to, to you know to, as a, to force it to be um, a necessitist one it's you'd have to do something a bit weird in order to get it to come out in a contingentist way so this is as we were kind of encouraging from the point of view of a necessitist but uh, although that's I mean I mean that's not my main concern here um, then um, there's also the, the principle that I've called propositional atoms, which again is that that's just a um, a corollary of the the, the fact that that we're interp interpreting these quantifiers as ranging over all sets of um, states, and so in particular, it's ranging over singleton sets. So that uh, the, the singleton sets of um, like that. I mean, these these are the the propositional atoms uh, that we that we get. Um, by the way, in passing, one thing that's quite nice about this way of articulating the kind of modal temporal content is that w when you th when you think of these dynamical systems as uh, set theoretic structures, then of course you have to distinguish between the set the state S and the, as it were, the proposition uh, that is just a singleton of S. But of course, the, the distinction between these is, I mean, it's not one that corresp corresponds to anything physical. All right? I mean, there's no sort of physical distinction in the system between the state and the singleton of the state. And when, when, you, when you articulate the, the, the content in, in this modal, uh, temporal way, then you, you don't have to bother anymore with, with this distinction. I mean, in effect, you're only, really, you're only looking at, at this one. Um, so that, you know, in some ways, it kind of smooths out uh, complexities that are introduced by the set theoretic uh, framework. Um, and then I've put in a couple of just of uh, um, de ray modal claims that, that you get um, from these these systems, I mean, there is a U, there's a U such that I mean, there's a, necessarily it obtains, and and one such that necessarily it doesn't obtain. Because I mean, these are interesting in relation to to Quine's uh, skepticism about de ray modalities, because you know his his idea was well, they, you know, it's difficult to to make to interpret de ray modalities in you know in any way that's that's consistent with a, you know, a modern scientific approach. But the point is, you know, if you just articulate the modal temporal structure like this, you, you automatically validate some de ray uh, modal, uh, modal claims. Um, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to, uh, to go into, uh, into some of the further d detail. I mean, I've, so, some of the, the, I've given some examples of how you can uh, articulate uh, much more uh, complex uh, ideas which arise in uh, dynamical uh, system theory because uh, dynamical system theory is, is the, the natural uh, mathematical framework for uh, studying uh, chaotic uh, systems like the weather, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, and what one... One point of doing this is that uh, when, when you look at the definitions of um, the, the mathematical notions that are used in uh, chaos theory, like attractor and basin of attraction and so on, um, you need to use this quantification into uh, sentence uh, position in order to articulate their content because they involve quantification over sets of states, sub, you know, quantification over subsets of S as, uh, as well as quantification over members of S. And that corresponds to uh, quantification into, uh, into sentence uh, position. So that the, this is another way in which uh, the, the higher order framework is not just, as it were, 
getting more complicated and abstract just for the sake of it. It's because the higher order, I mean, at least some version of the higher order framework is simply needed in order to uh, make explicit the, the kind of key ideas of uh, dynamical uh, systems theory. So I've, I've talked about this uh, example uh, in part uh, because uh, this seems to me an, a potential area for um, future uh, research in, in modal temporal logic because, um, well, I think both that there's, there's probably more work, uh, and pr probably lots more work uh, to, be, uh, to be done uh, in, um, in particularly with, with uh, dynamical systems here, but I think also other, other forms of phase space uh, lend themselves to this kind of uh, investigation. Um, it, it's also, you know, it's interesting to think about uh, types of uh, phase space uh, which need, well, to be articulated in ways that correspond to ordinary um, first order quantification over individuals rather than, than quantification into uh, sentence uh, position. And uh, th I mean, there are systems that are like that. I mean, they, they tend to be uh, called agent-based uh, systems where you actually, as it were, build the identity of uh, specific individuals into the, uh, the structure of the, uh, the system. I, you know, for example, you know, uh, systems that are concerned with the um, interaction of uh, s s some finite number of particles, or well, possibly an infinite number of particles, where, where, you, where different dimensions of the states correspond to different uh, properties of the individuals that you're concerned with. I mean, the individuals, they might be particles, or uh, you know, in a, di a biological model, they might be cells or animals or uh, whatever it is. Is and and so um, both with dynamical systems and with other kinds of phase space, it seems to me that this is an an area for future investigation to, to see just what kind of structures uh, we get when we articulate these things in a you know in the kind of way that I've illustrated uh, with the semantics uh, here and. Um, and which enable us to understand the, the more explicitly the modal and temporal aspect that's implicit in the mathematics that is used to uh, pursue these kinds of scientific uh, investigation. And you know, and I don't, I don't think that we should regard, the, as it were, the mathematics as the as it were the, the the formulation that most closely captures w w what the intended interpretations of these things are. Because the, what the mathematics does is, uh, all, I mean, of course, it's fantastically useful for its power, but it, 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 it somewhat suppresses the, the kinds of uh, modal and temporal uh, assumptions that are being made. And you know, one role for the modal temporal logic is to make those uh, assumptions uh, explicit and to see that all along, really, we've been investigating uh, questions uh, in, uh, as well, applied uh, modal temporal logic. Thanks very much. <laughs>
you said that that this debate uh, doesn't reduce uh, just to the choice of quantifier uh, yeah. interpretation. But uh, uh, I still do have the impression <laughs> that it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to illustrate uh, why uh, uh, I feel this impression uh, by an example you use. So uh, I uh, might have not been. So uh, I, I, I do not exist in some past world, in a sense, but uh, you said necessity say that in some other cells I do exist in the past world, mm -hmm. namely as a non object yeah. And uh, some, uh, <coughs> uh, this reply uh, presupposes the distinction between, between concrete and non concrete objects. And uh, if we have such a distinction, then we can have two interpretations for quantifiers. Uh, uh, we can let our quantifiers let, uh, uh, we can let them range uh, just on concrete, and uh, we can have quantifiers ranging both on concrete and non -concrets. And uh, if we uh, have uh, these two interpretations for quantifiers, then uh, we can have both the necessity explain and uh, the uh, contingent explain, so they seem to be compatible. Uh, so yeah. OK. So I, I, I agree that you could you could have someone who, who seemed to be a contingentist, because, but the only reason was because they were restricting their quantifiers to, to concrete objects. And, they w but, and that person would really be a necessitist in disguise. Um, but so, that, so of course, the, there are some cases where the apparent disagreement is just a product of misunderstanding about uh, the intended interpretation. But the way I explained the, the, the intended interpretation of the, the quantifiers was just by saying that it was, uh, it was intended to be absolutely unrestricted. And the, the real contingent test is not the person who's, who's restricting their quantifiers to, con to concrete objects. It's the person who thinks that even when you let your quantifiers range as unrestrictedly as you like, um, we will still get contingency in what there is. And so uh, an example of someone who is very explicitly a contingentist in this sense uh, is uh, Robert Stolnaker. Um, and w w and when, when he explains his position, um, it's quite clear that, he, that he's not really you know, a necessitist in disguise who's just restricting his quantifiers to the concrete. It's that he just thinks that th there are none of these objects which the, the necessitist is positing. I mean, the, 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 these contingently non-concrete objects and so on, you know, so that, as it were, however, you know, it's like when you go, when you go fishing with a net, right. if you, uh, depending on the size of the holes in the net, you'll, there'll, you, you, there'll be some fish that you catch and other fish that you don't catch, but um, the you know, because you, you won't catch the ones that are, too, that are smaller than the, the holes in the, in the net. But the real contingentist is somebody who thinks that even when we've caught all the fish in the sea, I mean, there just are not enough fish for, for the necessitist. And, that, and Stolnaker is somebody like that. So that, you know, the, the, and I think, you know, I think he and I would actually probably, we would agree that in some sense, neither, neither of us on, on this fundamental matter is misunderstanding the... Uh, the other, we, you know, it, it's just that we genuinely disagree about what is out there in the in the sea. It's not. It's not that we we're, we're just that we're fishing with different sized nets. Uh, anyway, if we uh, if we adopt uh, 
if we if we can contingent list if if we can contingent list uh, adapts uh, uh, Kripke model with very yes. name, then <coughs> then of course the guide <laughs> can can consider the uh, the union of all the domains. Yes. And, uh, <coughs> if so, uh, uh, then he can introduce. Uh, he can uh, simply stipulate that uh, there is another. Uh, uh, he can introduce into the formal language uh, another type of quantifiers for the union of all the domains. Why not? And, uh, does this uh, make him to uh, yeah. But th the thing is, that was why I was emphasizing that contingentists don't regard the Kripke semantics as, as fully faithful to, the, to what, what they intend. So, of course, you're right. You know, if, if we've got a Kripke model, th th then... Um, Sure, we can, quant you know, we can form the union of all the domains. I mean, that's, you know, th th there's no problem in doing that. And in fact, in the, in the meta language, we're already quantifying over all, all these objects and all the domains. That's, that's absolutely fine. But, but that isn't going to uh, help the, uh, the, the contingentist uh, if they think that this, the whole, the, in a way, the structure of the... Um, the, the Kripke model is somewhat misleading as to, to metaphysical reality, which is what they do think. I mean, they, I mean Stolnaker has an, uh, quite an elaborate account uh, of um, w which aspects of the models are, are supposed to be just uh, artifacts uh, uh, and which, which uh, you know, genuinely re represent features of uh, of the modal reality and the you know the, the kind of thing that you get just by you know forming the union of domain is really that from his point of view that is in effect a kind of artifact rather than uh, you know a uh, the what what was something that represents uh, the the underlying structure of of reality so so that that he I think he would not he would not re, he do, he would not regard forming the union as genuinely vindicating any kind of necessitism. Ethics influence on metaphysics, and does it influence on this debate somehow? Ethics. Yes. Um, so the, there are some interactions between ethical debates and these modal debates, because, as, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, um, because, for example, um, you know, one, one issue that ethicists discuss is uh, issues about uh, population growth. And, and so they're concerned with um, the welfare of I individuals that, you know, who are, who are not born but could have been born, and so on, and you know, and they're they're interested in questions, you know. I mean, I guess it's this is particularly, but I don't think only for for people who are, who are sort of consequentialist or utilitarian in in their views, because um, you know, if if we're if we're supposed to be maximising utility, and you know, and then the increasing the population would, would maximize utility, then, you know, we should, you know, maybe we have an ethical duty to be out there, you know, m making as many babies as we, as we possibly can. Um, and, um, you know, so, you know, and, and also when, you know, when people discuss things about, you know, like the, the evil of death, I mean, they're, they're discussing, of course, there it's a more t the temporal issue, but it's a very, very similar, met metaphysically, you know, similar issue about, uh, you know, in what sense, um, you know, it's, in what sense it's terrible to be dead, and, you know, and it's, it's you know, it's, it's um, and, um, and so, as well, we've, we, you know, some, some of the arguments in the, 
ethical literature depend on metaphysical premises, you know, uh, you know, to the effect that, you know, that you, that's where you shouldn't be considering the welfare of, of non-existent people and so on. And so, so there is an interaction with, with these uh, issues. And, um, you know, and, I, and of course, you know, one question would be, well, suppose that we didn't like the ethical consequences of, um, of a certain um, modal uh, view, then uh, you know, could that in principle uh, be relevant evidence for, uh, for you know, that, uh, so, so could, it, and in fact, actually another area where, where people have made such arguments, I mean, not exactly the same, but in modal, modal metaphysics is in some debates over David Lewis's modal realism, where you know, people were inclined to say, well, you know, in some sense, modal re his modal realism seems to make action uh, futile because you know, w w whatever, whatever we do, it, it, you know, it'll still be overall that we get the same distribution of pleasure and pains across you know, the, the totality of uh, Lewis uh, worlds. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to completely exclude the, um, the possibility that, you know, sometimes ethical uh, consequences can be relevant in assessing a logical theory. So, you know, so, so, suppose, suppose we came across some very clever logician and, you know, he, he gave us this, you know, his, he got to have a, has a, had a new system of set theory and then somehow or other from this new system of set theory he managed to derive that he should be paid a salary, you know, a thousand times greater than that of anybody else in the world. I, I think, you know, alarm bells should be going off in our heads at that point and we should, you know, realise that somebody, somebody who's, who's um, who's producing a, a theory that, with an implication like that, it, it's probably you know, f from a practical point of view, that I think that would be enough, you know, n not not to take it, it seriously, even if it was extremely difficult to to pen it down. I mean, uh, something that's maybe a little bit more realistic is, you know, you, you could imagine a co an economist who who had some very you know fancy kind of. It, it, Modeling in economics, which had the implication that economists should be paid, you know, a thousand times more than anyone else. I, you know, I think we would we would all be laughing at such a, a theory. And um, you know, and so and it, so I don't totally uh, exclude that. Um, and you know, and it might. I, I mean, you know, a case that's maybe you know another sort of case is, after all, you know. It, in a different area of science, you know, we might we might think that the that some of the ethical implications of you know kind of Nazi race science or something like that are, are already a warning sign that this is probably bad science <laughs> apart from anything else. Uh, uh, of course, this is you know I'm I'm I mean part, it partly depends on on what meta ethical views you have but you know I, I'm inclined towards some kind of moral realism according to which you know ethical claims are true or, fa or false like other claims them and, and and we do know something about which are true and which are false and you know and so um, you know as as with I mean the you know human knowledge is not kind of divided into Compartments which have no connections with each each other, and so you know, I don't, tot I do not totally exclude the idea that you know a scientific idea could be known to be false because of um, it, it, its ethical, uh, I mean, it, its implausible ethical consequences. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I don't think it's very likely, but I, th but I don't, I don't think that's I excluded in in principle. Um, about yourself, about your choice between mysticism and consciousness. Did that fix somehow influence on your, on your choice? Um, so, uh, so I'm not, I'm not a very moralizing kind of person. So, so you know, I, I'm, and I'm, so speaking for my, myself, I'm, you know, I'm more influenced by the, uh, you know, which, um, 
I, I'm, yeah, but uh, by the way, if, if, you're, if you're curious, um, th th this is now not to do with logic, but with epistemology. Um, I, uh, I recently uplo had uploaded a paper on my webpage called Morally Loaded Cases in Epistemology, which is, um, and so the case that I'm in interested in there is, um, you know, various kinds of apparent moral consequences of uh, views like relativism, skepticism, and internalism and epistemology. And so, um, so one of the things that I was considering there is certain kinds of internalism in epistemology which say that, that the justification of beliefs uh, is purely a matter of their internal coherence. Um, and, uh, and then I was saying, you know, you, you, so one way of arguing against that is to argue that uh, the effect of that will be that, you know, the, the beliefs of uh, some horrible neo-Nazi are, um, are, are justified, provided that the, this neo-Nazi is completely uh, consistent in, in all their, their beliefs and intuitions and so on. And, and you know, and, I, and arguing that that, it, that is a consequence which genuinely casts doubt on, on an epistemological theory that has that consequence. So I'm, so I'm in fact, I'm committed to, to the legitimacy of that kind of argument in, in epistemology. And although I think it's harder to make such arguments in logic, I don't totally exclude it. Because in some very loose sense, you know, human knowledge is a unity and, and you know, we, we have to be answerable to consequences in all sorts of unexpected uh, Places. Uh, Ilya, because first, no, okay. Uh, is uh, Leibniz an explicit contingentist or not? Uh, I mean, uh, his idea of that our world is the uh, best one and yes. uh, it is the only world that was created. Um, the other world was not created, so there is a lot of things that uh, is nothing at all. So can we say that he's explicit contingentist? Yeah, but I, th I think he probably is a, con a contingentist. But you, you have to look a bit further than just the fact that he thinks that only one world is created. And of course, with the worlds themselves, you know, it's a bit complicated with Leibniz because he tends to think of them as having all having some kind of notional existence as ideas in the mind of God, and you know, and so the, you know, the, because so he might. Uh, uh, these might be what you know people sometimes call ersatz worlds. I mean, they're, you know, they're not. These are not concrete worlds. But, um, but in, in Leibniz's case, you know, he he seems to have wanted to individuate individuals um, according to individual concepts, where the individual concept, you know, is a kind of complete description of the individual, and um, the and in fact. The, the complete description of the in individual is, uh, is one which will entail a complete description of the, the world, which is sort of connected with the way that you know, Leibniz thinks that every, uh, every monad you know, kind of uh, uh, reflects the, the whole structure of the world from its own point of view. And, and so, uh, so then he, you know, he seems to be saying that that you know, if anything had happened differently, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been one of us who'd ex existed, but just some other, you know, perhaps somewhat similar individual in that possible world. And so, in fact, Leibniz is going for, it seems, for a very strong form of contingentism in, in which um, the... Well, to put it in, in kind of the terms of Kripke models, in, you know, in where the, the domain of, of any two worlds is, that, that are mutually exclusive. So, uh, of course, I mean, interpreting Leibniz is difficult because there's kind of layer after layer uh, you know, in his theory, but, but it looks as though he's, he's a pretty explicit contingentist. But you have to look at what he says about individuals to, to get that from him. Uh, in some other possible worlds, you're right, I quote, 
since the model is an actual set theoretic structure of the degree object. Well, and the, the object under consideration is actually something. Unquote. So, uh, my trouble is uh, uh, this, uh, <coughs> this word actually. Uh, do you use it as, as, a, uh, as a model operator uh, of the object? language or method linguistic. Uh, uh, the term, uh, it, it, it seems uh, <coughs> unclear uh, for me because uh, if you use uh, this word method linguistically, then the argument seems not to be valid. But if, if we want to, to, to have uh, this argument valid, then uh, uh, the, uh, then uh, the word actually must belong to the object language. And then uh, we have to drop, so to speak, uh, the distinction between uh, object language and method language. Yeah. So, the way that we could formulate um, the Actual, uh, actual object there would be using an uh, actually, you know, th there exists y such that x equals uh, y. Um, but the, I mean, the, the difficulty, uh, it is that in the, in the, the way that, uh, with the crip key, a variable domain crip key model, the way that the quantifier is being interpreted um, is, you know, as a, um, a restrict. It's being interpreted as a restricted quantifier. Uh, so, w w when we're evaluating with respect to a particular world, it's just restricted to the domain of that world, and so it's it, it's not really the uh, the notion of of being something that that we're interested in from the uh, point of view of this metaphysical uh, dispute, um, and um, the so the the object language, you know, as interpreted over the Kripke model, can't interpret the intent the intended meaning of an you know an actual object. Um, and um, if if we you know if we interpret this you know in the intended way, then um, what we uh, what we get is something uh, much more general. I mean, in fact, the the actual here is is really more rhetorical than anything else because well, for you know in the uh, if we're working in the uh, the meta language for. Um, the uh, for the Kripke model, then of course it's a non-modal uh, meta language, and so the actually operator would be completely redundant there, and uh, and then um, what what we're what we're talking about is just that um, I mean anything whatsoever uh, exists in the uh, in this unrestricted sense. I mean this is this is you know what, roughly speaking. Um, what you know, what Quine is talking about when he says, you know, the, the, the ontological question is what is there, and, and there's an easy answer to it, which is everything, and yeah. uh, and the, and so the the everything um, corresponds to the, you know the fact that the elements of the, the the domains of the worlds in this this model are just you know they're just more things. I mean, they might be numbers or apples and oranges or whatever we happen to to, to put into the uh, into the, the model. Um, so, you know, I think, and this is, this is something that a contingentist like Stolnaker accepts that, uh, I mean, he accepts that the, that the object in the, you know, in, a, in any given Kripke model will be one which just exists in a quite straightforward sense. And, and so, you know, he, he takes that as a, an aspect of the model, which is um, 
a kind of, you know, an artifact of the, the mathematical framework that we're using to do this modelling, and, and not something which is a kind of guide to the, under, <laughs> the underlying reality. Um, and, you know, and so, I mean, I think w w one way that Stolnaker and I, you know, maybe disagree a little bit is, is that I think he thinks that, that you know, it's, you can think of these, the, the kind of Kripke models as, you know, having, a, kind of capturing the metaphysical reality in some ways, even though they also have various aspects, like the one that we're just talking about, which, which are not corresponding to anything in metaphysical reality. I, I do, I'm not satisfied with the way in which he tries to articulate which aspects of them you know, are represent, representational in his terms and which are just artefacts. But, but I mean, I think, um, I think he would accept the idea that, the, that you know, it, it, it is not the case that all aspects of this model are, are, in, you know, are intended to, to represent the, the underlying metaphysical reality. are interested in something pretty similar to crypto models and uh, since crypto models are misleading for metaphysical considerations probably contingent pieces should go to should have to the realm of hyperintentionality I guess Robert Stolmecki would love to comment a bit yeah so Stolnaker doesn't exactly go uh, hyper in intentional. What, what I mean, the way that he he treats this issue um, is by trying to filter out the 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 mere artifacts of the Kripke models by by using um, a, a criterion of invariance under certain kinds of uh, permutation, so that the, you know the, the 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 way that you represent that the that the elements of the actual world of the model are, are intended to have you know more reality than the uh, tended to correspond you know to reality specifically in a way that the the non actual ones uh, don't is, is that that you look at permutations which fix the um, the actual the members of the actual the domain of the actual world i mean that that, that they they have to be you know if this sigma is the interpret is the permutation then they get mapped to themselves but the but the permutation can move around the objects that are outside the domain of the actual world, and um, and so, as I say, I, do, I, do, I don't think that he, that that Stolnik has given a, a really satisfactory a, a account of this. Um, but but that's that's the kind of um, methodology that he's using to try to you know separate out wh the artifactual from the genuinely representational, and that I, I don't. Uh, I don't see that that's uh, hyper in, intentional in some way. I mean, in the the thing is, in the meta language, all this talk of permutation and variance and so on. I mean, it's just basically being done in a mathematical meta language. So there's, you know, it's not more hyper, hyper intentional than any other bit of mathematics. I mean, it's basically ex extensional, um, and. Then, at the level of the the modal language, the, these, he's not trying to to put these permutations into the lang into the modal object language. So I, you know, I, do, I don't see that that that's uh, something uh, hy hyper intentional. I'm not I'm not quite sure w what kind of hyper intentional device. You have in mind for that, that would help the contingentist in articulating their, pos their position. I mean, there might there might be something, but at the moment, I'm not seeing w w what it is. It, Thank you very much. Oh, just so the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but on the short one, uh, I'd like to uh, add to the question about uh, uh, 
actual existence, possible existence, uh, different types of quantifiers and so on. Uh, uh, what do you think about, uh, in Wagen's point of view, uh, 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 about quantifiers? Uh, um, uh, Wagen rejects uh, unrestricted uh, quantifiers at all. Uh, in particular, uh, he interprets uh, uh, David Lewis uh, as uh, a philosopher who um, uh, uh, uses existence is only one uh, in, in only one sense. Uh, in one believes that uh, existence has uh, only one meaning, yes. and uh, 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 and uh, um, he uh, believes that if you um, uh, if you, you uh, think that flying being pigs exist in other words, uh, um, exist don't uh, have different meanings, meaning from um, exist uh, in uh, uh, ordinary yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Ordinary sentences. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, Van Enwag in, in many ways is, is quite uh, a Quinean, uh, um, and um, and you know, and I think um, that the you know, and, and I, I mean, the mere fact that, that you're talking about things, you know, or, 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 well, for, for, I mean, David Lewis uh, th thinks that uh, you can. Um, you know, t talk about there are flying pigs. It's just that that, that they're not in our spatio-temporal system. They're in some other spatio-temporal system, and you know. And I think Van Inwagen is is right to say that you don't need any special sense of the term existence to uh, for that. Um, and um, you know, I I, th I think that on on Van. You know, it, you know th th those examples are ones that that you can. You know, if you think of of existence just in terms of the first order quantifier, then you know th there's no amb there doesn't need to be any ambiguity in the first order quantifier. There can just be the, you know a single uh, first order quantifier, but it, which can be restricted. You know, but as you know by some conversational context. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, I think that really shouldn't be a problem for for Van. In Wagen. Um, of course, I mean, the issue about completely unrestricted quantification is, uh, is tied up with the issue of higher order quantification, which I guess Van Inwagen is not sympathetic to. And, you know, it, it, you know it, it, if, if you're going to defend unrestricted quantification, then you know, there are, it seems that what you, well, at least as the way I would go is uh, that, that uh, the way to defuse the paradoxes that you, you, you might be afraid of, like, you know, some form of Russell's paradox, is by having higher order quantification, which is not, it's not that that's uh, a restriction, you know, that it's not that first order quantification is a, res a restriction of higher order quantification, they're just com different types of quantification which are kind of incommensurable. Um, and that's something that Van Inwagen might not be happy to do, but, you know, with his kind of Quinean uh, preference for, f well, j privileging first order quantification re really to the exclusion of, of anything uh, else. But, but I mean, I think, you know, I. I I think what, what, he's, what Quine was reacting against, and, and I think to some extent Van Inwagen is following him in this, is that there were, you know, in the sort of 1940s and 50s and so on, you know, a lot of people who were claiming that, you know, if, if you talked about numbers existing and about um, sticks and stones existing, you, you had to be using the word exist in different senses. And, 
And I think it, Quine was right to, to point out that really no proper argument had been given for, for that, and that, that in those cases, it, it's enough just to have a, a single sense of exist being applied, you know, of a very general sort being applied to things of radically different kinds. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thanks for the discussion. <laughs>